All right. Hope everyone's doing well out there. Thanks for tuning in to uh, another presentation. Uh, my name's Tim from eMiniMind. And in the next 45, 50 minutes or so, we're going to be talking about day trading the eMini futures. And I'll be talking specifically about uh, the ES and how you can day trade the futures markets using a one minute chart. Um, if you're if you've been trading for a while, or if you trade a different time frame, everything that we're going to talk about today is applicable to different markets or different time frames. So even though I'll be pulling examples, and uh, I might, uh, if we have some time at the end, I can pull up my charts from today, and we'll talk about the ES, um, the S and P um, futures. The concepts and the strategies can be applied to all markets and all time frames, and especially when it comes to uh, the trade management uh, techniques. You can apply those to day trading, swing trading, you know, options, futures, forex, all the way across the board. So, lots of good stuff to go over today. And just to kind of give you an outline of where we're headed, so we're going to be talking about uh, three techniques that I've used on the futures market specifically. I've also used them uh, with swing trading stocks, but specifically today we're going to talk about uh, day trading. And uh, those three techniques, we'll be talking about uh, one-minute candles and places that you can get you know, the most likelihood of a trade to get some momentum as soon as you get in. We'll talk about uh, what I call the HLB, LHB, the high low bar, low a high bar entry. Um, I know there's a, a handful of people in the room who are uh, familiar with uh, my trade strategies and things like that. So we'll go over some of the basics and then we'll get into a little bit more the intermediate and advanced concepts. And then we'll talk about uh, the way that I trail my stop and manage my positions. I do some things a little bit differently than uh, you might be used to. And from a you know real applicable trading approach to where Sometimes you have an idea or you come up with a strategy or a technique that might seem like a good idea or on paper, it appears to be very profitable. But then when you get into the real world and you actually start trading it, uh, some things start to break down and you're just not able to execute for you know variety of reasons. So the way that I trail my stop allows you to kind of remove some of the subjectivity that comes after you're in a trade and stay very objective while also being able to capitalize and kind of get the most out of the trade, get the most profit out of the trade with keeping a very reasonable uh, risk on the trade and throughout the trade. So the, the biggest benefit to trading, and this is probably what drew a lot of you to trading in the first place, is just that, that flexible lifestyle gaining some financial freedom, being able to, you know, trade in uh, wherever you're located and kind of freeing up your time and being able to leverage your hours worked in such a way that you gain, you know, the rest of the day to do other things besides trading. You know, the objective is not necessarily to sit in front of the screen all day long and trade one nine to five to another. So, it's really important to kind of keep that big picture uh, why, if you will, why are you doing this? Keep that big picture front and center because as you go through the ups and downs of trading, you know, things will uh, inevitably get hard at times. And you want to be able to make sure that you're uh, able to get through those slumps. I see a lot of folks, uh, you know, come and go through trading and it's, you know, no fault of, the trading strategy or trading in itself. It's just if you want to do something for the long term, you got to be able to weather the storm. You, know, you think about uh, January 1st and lots of folks trying to go on a new diet or lose weight and how many people are have already failed by January 15th. So it's the same concept. You look through you know, sports, professional sports, trading, um, health and fitness, you know, successful uh, entrepreneurs and, and business owners. I mean, it's how many people have the idea or start a thing and then give up as soon as it gets hard. 
So trading can be very easy when it's going well and you get in trades and your, your setups are hitting and you're going to targets and things like that. But it can be very difficult when you're going through a tough week. Maybe the market's just not very conducive to your setups that week, or you're having a stressful week and you're not seeing the markets clearly and being able to be very, very conscious of what you're going through and bringing to trading. So you can say, you know what, I'm just, I'm not having a great morning uh, headspace today and I'm going to be better off not trading than trying to trade with all these distractions. And then I got to, I have a meeting to go to and I have a deadline over here and you know, those are the days that you end up blowing up an account because you're just so flustered and, and that kind of stuff. So um, there's a lot of things that are outside of the trade setup that are much more important than people realize than the actual trade setups. So whether you like to um, bike, golf, hike, you got kids, grandkids, um, you're just you and your spouse and you like to travel, trading is a great, uh, great avenue for that. So um, I would consider myself a part-time trader that makes full-time income. Um, you, you could put it another way and just say, you know, I, I'm a full-time trader. That's my job, if you will. But the time commitment that I spend in front of the screen now is very little. I'm mostly trading the NICE open. So the first 90 minutes of the day, and then I do a little bit of trade management at the end of the day to manage swing trade positions or you know longer term stuff that I'm holding overnight. I do all that in the last 15 minutes at the close. And occasionally I'll manage a trade if I get in in the morning and I'm still in it by the afternoon. Occasionally that happens if I'm trailing my stop and I might have to manage that trade. But otherwise, you know, the open is when most of my trading occurs and all of my analysis has really been truncated down to a very concise, you know, small five, 10 minutes before the open, kind of going through the same routine every day. And so realistically, you know, I wake up, I have a few things set up the night before on my chart and then wake up in the morning. And, and realistically, you know, I could pull up my charts five minutes before, run through my kind of morning checklist and then be ready to trade you know, five, 10 minutes after the opening bell. <clears throat> so a little bit about me, and then we'll get into the uh, strategies and, and some charts here. I've been trading for about, uh, oh, going on maybe 16 years, 15, 16 years. And um, I got my start swing trading. A lot of people turn to day trading because of the low barrier to entry as far as cost is concerned. And swing trading seems very, um, high capital intensive. And while it is, in a sense, uh, the ability to use very strict reward to risk and very precise entries is in a lot of ways equal to that of futures where you're trading in, in ticks uh, or Forex, you're trading in pips. But um, you know, being accurate in trading off the trade ladder, there's a lot of ways that swing trading is um, is very similar. So I got my trading in 2000 or got my start trading in 2006. Um, I grew up in the Chicagoland area. So I had a lot of access to traders and uh, the best part about, you know, being in the Chicagoland area is that access to traders and the other like-minded people, whether it was, you know, the board of trade or um, uh, downtown at uh, thinkorswim was downtown, infinity futures were downtown. So there was a lot of, um, access to traders and, and firms and things like that. Uh, Tom Sosnoff, Don Kaufman, a lot of those guys um, all were based out of Chicago at that time. And um, day trading futures was something that I added in about mm, 2008. So two years after I started swing trading and kind of got that process dialed, that's when I shifted it over to the, uh, the futures market, made some tweaks, obviously went down to a much smaller time frame, and then going to uh, that smaller time frame is what allowed me to be a little more active in the morning. So um, swing trading, day trading, they make a nice uh, kind of pairing, if you will. A lot of times when the volatility is very low, kind of like what we saw this summer, you're in a strong bull trend, volatility is low. You can stay in you know, swing trades on daily time frames a lot longer, but when volatility is high, 
it's harder to stay in swing trades longer, but then you have a lot more day trade opportunities. So they do make a nice pairing if you're um, if you're a swing trader or started swing trading. Uh, you don't have to throw it away just to day trade futures. And you can make a lot of money swing trading stocks, even if you're trading just a couple of stocks um, a month even. Uh, so sometimes the, uh, the allure of day trading can be uh, appealing, but there's a lot of benefits to both. So, um, and I've had the pleasure of speaking in a number of the traders expos and CME and things like that. But outside of trading, and this is really important, you know, you can spend a lot of time in front of the screen and kind of consume, consume, consume all this information, all the YouTube videos, all the, you know, books and everything about trading. And if you don't internalize that information so that you can apply it, it's essentially useless. And, uh, you know, you could, you could spend years just sitting in a, a simulated trading account and not actually doing anything and learning through the experience. And so I've always been one to, you know, be a very hands-on learner, um, grew up, you know, kind of around the trades and working on houses and, you know, construction and plumbing and electrical and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, you could sit there and read a textbook about it, but really you got to get your hands dirty and learn, okay, what happens when I do this? What is the outcome going to be? And so getting away from the trading screen really allows you to internalize what you're learning and then light bulb kind of can go off while you're out on a hike or a bike ride or, um, you know, playing pickleball or whatever it is that you like to do. Um, so I like to get outside and do lots of stuff away from the trading screen. And that really helps clear my head and be able to focus when I'm actually in front of the screen trading. So uh, like I said, I'm from the Chicagoland area. Now I live out in Scottsdale, Arizona, um, ASU Sun Devil. So I spent uh, four years at ASU and then um, kind of split my time between Scottsdale in the you know nice months of the year while it's uh, beautiful out here. And then in the summer, <clears throat> go up to uh, South Dakota to the uh, Black Hills and, and spend my summer up there. So, you know, that is a direct byproduct of trading and being able to uh, be flexible with where I live and, and whatnot. And so, yes, I'm a little constricted to the, the morning time slot as far as, uh, you know, trading the open, but uh, other than that, you know, your day is pretty much, uh, pretty much free. So let's dive into uh, my chart setup and how I trade the one minute chart and some tools and things that you can use to uh, to day trade with. So everything that we're going to talk about here is is not specific to one trading platform. So I use Thinkorswim for my charts. I use Tradeavate for my uh, trade execution. Uh, they've been acquired by Ninja Trader, just like everybody else. I used Infinity Futures for a long, long time, probably a decade. Um, they've also been acquired by uh, Ninja. So, um, but Thinkorswim to me has the best charts. I've used them from day one. I know Tom and you know a lot of the guys who were uh, you know, the founders of Thinkorswim. So um, just very familiar and comfortable. And this is essentially my chart setup. I will toggle the time frame if I need to go you know to a 15 minute chart or a daily chart rather than having you know 10 charts open at once. I just like to keep it very simple. Um, I do have two monitors, and on my right monitor. So this is my left one. On my right one, I've got my trade ladder and then my Excel uh, trade log. So other than that, those are the only two things that I really have open. Um, this bottom chart is the nicey tick. We're not going to get too much into that. If you day trade, it's very, very useful. And uh, if you uh, if you go to E-mini Mind and just search in the box nicey tick, you can get the um, kind of, I guess, code, if you will, to set this chart up. And if you just put it on your chart and kind of leave it there and make some observations, uh, in time, you'll be able to you know, learn about uh, how it works. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about it at the end, but I don't want to get uh, too into the weeds on that. You don't need it to trade, but it does, uh, it does give you some good insight. And if you're just focusing in on one market and one time frame, at least for starters, you know, starting out with the ES, and starting out with the one minute chart is a great place to begin. And then you can expand either by going to other markets. So you could add the, the NASDAQ or you know other markets in. Um, you could 
increase the number of contracts. So if you're starting with two contracts and getting comfortable, um, well, a lot of people now are starting with the, the micros and then you get up to the minis and uh, getting to two mini contracts is kind of a real big leap. So when I started, there were no micros. So you just started trading one e-mini futures contract. And that was by far the hardest because you're stuck deciding, okay, this is my one exit point. And do I take a profit target at a fixed point or do I trail my stop? And no two trades are going to be the same. So if you can get to multiple contracts, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, there's a lot of benefits more so psychologically that, uh, that really help you become uh, a really good trader. So getting to two mini contracts and then, you know, working your way up to three, four, five, six, uh, you, you don't necessarily have to be trading 20, 30 contracts to make a decent return um, or, or make a decent profit. Return with futures percentages aren't super applicable because um, you could have, you know, $15,000 in an account and be trading two contracts and be trading that same $15,000 and percentage returns are going to look giant, but it's not really the best uh, the best gauge of how well your trading is. So um, this is my trade setup, and uh, you can use whatever platform you want, and just you know keeping things as simple as possible. I do have a 21 EMA uh, that I put on I don't know maybe nine months or a year ago, and other than that, I don't really use any um, you know indicators, stochastics, moving average, uh, other moving averages other than the 21. Um, MACD and whatnot. So um, the important thing about the candlestick chart, as you, you know, as we're looking at, this is a traditional candlestick chart. Most people are familiar with that. Um, you could use a bar chart. It's a slightly, it's the same interpretation, but just a slightly different uh, angle, if you will. But we're going to talk about uh, just the traditional candlestick. And the Two important ones that we're going to be looking at are the hammers and the inverted hammers. And these are really easy to spot. You can, you know, most people are probably already familiar at them, familiar with them. You'll see them on daily charts, intraday charts. And the nice thing about these candlestick patterns is that because they're easy to spot, it makes that signal bar very easy to identify. And so a hammer is just a candle with a very small body or head, and the body is going to be at the top of that candle. So the top of the range, I like it to be in the top quarter or top third of the entire bar. So the body is like a third of the entire bar with this tail sticking down below or this wick sticking down below. Sometimes they, the open and the close are the exact same. That's doji, where they uh, open and close at the same price. That also you know, constitutes uh, the setup when we're talking about hammers. Um, and then we're going to be uh, looking for things like uptrends and double bottoms. And then when we come to an inverted hammer, we just turn the, turn the setup um, upside down. And so an inverted hammer would have the candle with the body towards the bottom of that bar with the tail sticking up above the the body doesn't have to be an absolute low of the bar, like the uh, the hammer here. This high on this right one, the high is also the high of the bar. Uh, or the high of the bar is the top of the hammer, whereas on this inverted hammer, the body, it's in that bottom third, but there's a little bit of a tail or a wick to the downside. I don't, you know, that doesn't bother me too much. The main idea is that we've traded in the case of an inverted hammer. We traded up above, we closed the bar lower, and I'm looking for the market to then move lower. And so with inverted hammers, looking for things like downtrends or double tops to associate those inverted hammers, those are places that we want to be kind of starting to look for trades. And again, you know, this chart, it could be a daily chart. Um, we're talking about things in the context of, of day trading, but these could easily be daily bars. And, you know, when I got my start with swing trading, that's exactly what I did using the, uh, you know, buying strong stocks on pullbacks, looking for those hammers and then shorting or selling 
weak stocks on bounces looking for inverted hammers. And not to sidetrack too, too much, but if you just do a search for stocks that are making 52-week highs and stocks that are making 52-week lows, and then just add that list every day to an Excel log and then filter out the duplicates, after three, four days, you know, those some of those 52-week highs might be pulling back a little bit. And then when you can uh, you know, circle back to those stocks three, four, five, six days later, look for that pullback, look for that hammer, and that is your re-entry point into that uptrend. So you already know the stock, if it's making a 52-week high, fundamentally, it's probably pretty solid. Fund and then technically, it's probably in an uptrend of some kind. And you know, you can go through and, and pick out the best ones, but that is a great approach to kind of quickly and simply filter out strong trends, both up and down, just by looking for 52-week highs and 52-week lows. And then when you pair that with the signal bar being a hammer in an uptrend and an inverted hammer in a downtrend, now you really put a lot of the odds in your favor to be getting into a trade with momentum with a stock that was already at 52-week highs and likely to return to 52-week highs. So if we uh, if we then drill down to the smaller time frame to the uh, the one minute chart and kind of ask, okay, well, why are these trades um, so powerful and impactful? Because it's signaling price has been rejected, and we're likely to trade in the other direction. So if you get a um, if you get a hammer. And you're in an uptrend, really doesn't matter what the trend is at the time. A hammer is signaling that the price went lower over the course of that one minute at some point and then rallied into the close. We had that uh, yesterday where we uh, sold off intraday and then rallied into the close and formed this real tight, uh, almost doji um, on the daily chart. And the, uh, was it yesterday or two days ago? The days kind of blend together. I think it was yesterday. Um, and so intraday, if you were to look at a daily candle that formed a hammer, you're going to have this big V, big down move, then big up move. And so that's what's happening when you get these hammers. And so what I call high of low bar means buying, in the case of futures, one tick above the high of the low bar in the pullback or high above the hammer. The hammer is going to be the lowest bar if you buy one tick above it just by definition if the market pulls back then you get a hammer and it breaks the candles high it breaks the hammers high then that bar that's your signal bar that becomes your your entry point one tick above the candles high on the very next bar so looking for um, these types of candles hammers and inverted hammers um, it's going to give you really good momentum plays or momentum trades. So looking at the uh, the high price of the candle and then adding a tick is the entry. Um, it becomes, you know, a lot of times you'll have two or three bars that uh, pull back. And when you kind of look for that third, fourth, fifth bar to be a hammer, it also happens to be the lowest bar in the pullback. If each candle is making a lower low and then you get a hammer and you break above that bar, well, just by default, that becomes the lowest bar in the pullback. So uh, if you turn your chart upside down, uh, then you're looking for a low price of that inverted hammer and then subtracting a tick and that will give you an entry into a short. So looking for the uh, low price of the candle, uh, it ends up being you know the the high price or the high candle in the bounce or the pullback, and then uh, that's that's what gives you your inverted hammer. Um, cool little trick on Thinkorswim. If you type uh, the minus sign in front of a symbol, it will and then you know minus backslash es or minus uh, Tesla, uh, it will turn it will flip the chart upside down. So if you're ever looking at a chart and you think oh this. I think I want to go long on this chart. It looks pretty bullish. And then if you flip it upside down and you're looking at it and you say, 
okay, yeah, this this chart looks like I would want to go short, and you know it's upside down, then that kind of confirms that yes, indeed, you want to go long. But if you're looking at a chart and you're like, eh, that kind of looks like a long, I I think I want to um, take a trade here. And then you turn it upside down and you're like, eh, yeah, it kind of looks like a long. Then it's like, whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute here. If I'm seeing long in both directions, then it must not be as clear as I as I think. So let's talk about, we talked about the entry being above, you know, one tick above a hammer, uh, one tick below an inverted hammer. If you're using a, a stock or an ETF or you're trading the SPY, something like that, um, depending on the size of the stock, you know, if it's a hundred dollar stock, 10 cents is, uh, is plenty um, to use above the candle, even five cents at times, if, especially if it's like a $50 stock. Um, I guess you could say, um, you know, 0.01 percent, but um, just kind of a, a five to 10 cents above or below the uh, the candle is is fine. Um, probably leaning more towards five for something like the, uh, the SPY or the QQQ or something like that. If it's a, a really expensive stock, $500 stock, you might go 20 cents. But um, the, the main idea is you want to get in as it's breaking the high of the candle. Um, or the low of the candle if it's an inverted hammer. So um, for the initial stop, I like to use um, the opposite end of the candle. So if it's a uh, if it's a hammer, then you know putting your stop below the tail. And reasonable size candles to me are four points or less. This morning we had some bigger candles. Uh, there were a couple hammers and inverted hammers that were like five, six points. And I'm not against trading those candles that are very big, but you want to first relate those candles to the prior ones. If you have candles that are five, uh, three or four points and then you get an eight point hammer, okay, that's a lot bigger than the prior candles we saw for the day. So probably going to pass on that trade. But like today, all the candles were seven, eight points or even bigger, um, six, seven, eight, nine points. So if I see a five point candle, just meaning the high and the low of the candle were five points, it's okay to take the trade, but I will use half size. So that way my risk if I'm using a three-point candle, let's say as my three points as my stop, and I have four contracts, well, that's the same as trading a six-point candle, a six-point stop, with two contracts. So you always want to kind of keep your keep your risk in checked in, in check. So looking at those prior bars, um, keeping the kind of general size of the candles uh, in line. So if we get a uh, like in this trade, you kind of get a pullback. Maybe there's a prior low at this point. Maybe it's you know, maybe we double bottomed off the low of the day. Maybe it's the uh, prior day's close. There could be a lot of you know potential support reasons for the hammer. It doesn't really matter um, why we're bouncing because the candle is giving you that indication that price went down. Price was then rejected, and now we have uh, rallied and closed up towards the top of the candle, like in the top third, sometimes, you know, top half. Um, but I, I, for the most part, trying to get up, uh, having the hammer with the head or the body be in that top third is a really good, uh, good indication that uh, there was a strong reversal, if you will, on that one minute chart. So. The long entry is just a tick above the high and then the stop one tick below the low. Um, in the last couple of months, so I have my uh, my bracket order set for three points. And then what I will do is if the candle's only a point and a half, I'll just drag it up underneath the, the low of the bar. And um, for candles that were four points, I was dragging my stop down. So then my distance between my entry and my stop is four and a half points. One tick for entry, one tick for stop. And then you got uh, four and a half points. Um, but in the last couple months, I've just been leaving my stop at three points where I set it um, on those those occasional bigger candles. So those four point candles. 
And uh, if it's a lot larger and I'm cutting my position in half, then I'm okay, you know, putting my stop uh, a little bit wider than that. But um, three points has been kind of that uh, that max sweet spot that uh, I've found in the last couple of months. So I've just been kind of leaving it alone there. And then, um, you know, getting into the trade as the market pushes up through that hammer is is kind of the main the main idea. And then for uh, for an inverted hammer, you're getting short or selling. Uh, the futures one tick below, and then uh, starting with your stop, you know, three points away or, or above the tail, I guess, with whichever is less. And then um, we'll talk about trailing uh, the stop here in just a second. So when it comes to trailing the stop, so if you look at this this chart, again, I don't have the x-axis shown because, you know, I just want to indicate that this could be a daily chart. It could be a five-minute chart. It could be a one-minute chart. Um, if you're if one minute is too small or you prefer to trade a larger time frame, you can do that with the same same approach. The candles on the larger time frame are going to be bigger because there's more time contained in that candle, but the profit is also going to be bigger. So if you can stay in the trade and don't just uh, fall into a um, you know kind of fearful scalping mentality where the market's up two ticks and you just get out, uh, you can take a little bit larger risk and pair that with a larger reward if you're on a, a larger time frame. So what I like to do to trail my stop is to trail, uh, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can trail swing highs and lows. So a swing low is when the market pulls back and forms a low. And then when the market breaks out to a new high that solidifies the pullback as a swing low. So for this diagram here, if we look at the, um, if we say we're long from this, this red uh, hammer down here, um, or just we're long coming into this chart from the left hand of the chart, and this, I'm, my stop is below the lowest bar, once we rally, we get these four green bars, and we put in a swing high and we start to pull back. I still leave my stop at that initial stop point, below, uh, initial stop below the low. Let the market pull back to the pullback uh, doji candle there. And then when it breaks out, when it breaks above that swing high, and makes that new high, then you can bring your stop up to the next swing low under the pullback bar. And then leave it there. Let the market you know, consolidate, pull back a little bit, break out to a new high. And then you can bring your stop up underneath the next swing low. And you just repeat that process. That's That works super well for daily bars. It works really well for um, intraday. The, uh, the challenging part for most people is leaving the stop alone. You might have a six, seven, eight point unrealized gain on the trade, being able to let it pull back and then bounce before you start tightening your stop. And a lot of times with, uh, especially the ES, like the, the start of the trade can be the slowest to get going. But then once you get, you know, three, four points away from your start price, your entry price, then it gets pretty easy to manage the trade. And it can really start taking off. So um, that's one approach. That's kind of the most conservative approach um, or least aggressive trail stop, that's going to get you to stay in those winners the longest, but there's going to be times where the market pulls back and uh, you, and it breaks out and you bring your stop up and, uh, and then it pulls back and it keeps pulling back and it takes out your stop. And if you haven't had the chance to move your stop at least one leg, then you're at risk of that full stop out. So there's a couple things that I do that uh, help prevent that. The second way you can trail your stop is by trailing each candle. And this is kind of my preferred default method. It will, you're gonna get stopped out more, or let's, let's rephrase that. You're gonna get stopped out at times quicker than if you were trailing every single or trailing each swing low, letting the market rally, pull back, and then rally again and 
you know, move your stop. But what this does is allow you to tighten your stop very quickly out of the gate and be trailing your stop you know, every one minute, every single bar that closes, as long as the, the bar makes a new high. If it's an inside bar, I won't bother tightening it. But um, as long as the candle's making a new high, you can uh, tighten your stop underneath each bar. And in a couple of minutes, you know, you can have a guaranteed profit locked in on the trade. And that's a really good way, especially when you're first starting out psychologically, to know that, okay, boom, uh, you know, you hear your, your ding, you get in the trade, and then you know, the candle closes, next candle um, starts to form, and you can immediately tighten your stop. Sometimes, you know, in, in 10, 20 seconds, if you get filled late in the candle, and you go from a three-point stop to, boom, I'm already at, you know, minus one point. And then next candle forms, and I can move my stop up again, and hey, I'm at break even, and then hey, I'm at plus one and a half points. And if which in just a couple of minutes, you can be tightening your stop very quickly, and you're kind of preoccupied with that and you're not fo you're not you know stressing out about the 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 actual dollars that you're making on your on your trade and then all of a sudden you know you get a couple of bigger bars or just a couple candles that start running and you just trail 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 all the way through and it uh you can really lock in some good profits and you're getting out at the very first sign of that momentum change. So there are going to be times where you get ticked out after a couple of candles and it, you know, breaks the prior candles low by a tick or two and then turns around and goes higher. A lot of times you can get a higher low entry and, you know, re-enter on another hammer. Um, sometimes you just get taken out and it keeps running. If you prefer to do the uh, more, conservative approach and trail the swing lows, which works really well when volatility is low um, because the day trading moves tend to be slower when volatility is higher. The ranges, the candles tend to be bigger. And so we want to be locking in, um, tightening our stop quicker. But what you can do is use a four bar approach where you begin by trailing the swing lows if you're long. And if you get four green bars in a row, then you can switch to trailing each candle on that fourth bar. Because what it's what the market's indicating is, okay, I'm starting to trail, leave my stop, you know, kind of conservatively below the, the swing low. And then we get green, 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 green. It's like, okay, the market's starting to rip. I don't want to let the trade be, you know, 10, 12 points away from where my stop is and give up that profit. So if I get four green bars, then I can come in and start trailing each candle on the fourth bar. That works really well um, because then you're letting the market tell you how you're going to manage the trade. If it's slow and you kind of get a little rise and pull back and rise and pull back, you know, it could be 15, 20 minutes and you're, you're not getting a whole lot of movement. You're slowly tightening your stop, but um, it's, it's not a super fast trade. But then other times you get in the trade and it just starts ripping right away. And, and using the four bar a trail stop approach works really well to kind of come in and, and start tightening your stop. Um, another thing I want to point out while I'm here is to, uh, to kind of combat that challenge of, well, the market went, you know, seven, eight points and then rolled over. And uh, some trades, you know, you might get a, what I would call a home run where it might go 15 or 20 points. You know, that'd be a nice big winning trade. I don't necessarily try and target those trades. Like I try to trade the same way every single time, just like if you're stepping up to the plate or stepping up to the tee box, you know, you're going to swing your, your club with the same stroke and kind of the same uh, force and speed. And sometimes you connect with the ball and you hit it 300 yards, 350 yards. And other times, you know, you just duff it off the tee. Well, the times that you duff it off the tee are when you're trying to murder the ball and hit it 400 yards. So if you can use the same stroke, you know, the same entry, the same trail stop approach, 
then sometimes the market will just give you that opportunity. You'll connect, you'll get in at the right time, and the market will go 20 points. And by trailing your stop, you're able to stay in. But what you can do is split your position in half. This is why getting to multiple contracts is really helpful. And now with the, the uh, micros, being able to practice this with you know, multiple contracts is also really helpful. So split your position in half. So if you're trading two contracts, have you know, one of the contracts be this trail approach, uh, or let me say it a different way, have a fixed target on one of those contracts while you're trailing your stop at the same time on both of the contracts. And for simplicity's sake, you just trail, trail the same way. So if you're going to trail each bar, just trail both contracts, trailing each bar. And with the, uh, with the ES, a six-point uh, target works really well. You know, if you're using a three-point stop, a six-point profit target just happens to be two to one, a uh, reward to risk. And so if you use a six-point target on one contract and then don't have any target on the second contract, leave that one open-ended and just continue to trail Be if it goes to six points and beyond. Just continue to trail. But this way, if the trade goes six points and reverses, you lock in a, a guaranteed winning trade and uh, you're trailing your stop at the same time. If it, uh, if it rips and it's a big runner, then yeah, you got out at six points, but then the other half of the position, you got out for a lot more for a big runner. And so by having both of those kind of the arbitrary target and the trail stop that helps to not be kind of second guessing or having to make those decisions when you're in the trade. And it's a really, really good way to trail your stop with whatever, you know, even if you're swing trading and you have a hundred shares, take 25 off at, you know, a, a two to one reward to risk. Um, you can go down to one to one. So in, in the ES here, you could use a three point profit target and a trail stop. Um, I wouldn't go any less than that. And one-to-one -one is getting kind of small. You, you know, you, you don't want to be at a less than one reward to risk. And you can get in the habit of saying, oh, well, I'm trading 10 contracts. So I'm going to start scaling out on the way up. But you can get to 10 points and only have one contract left. And then your total reward to risk on the trade is not very good. So it's always going to be the most profitable to hang on to the trail as long as possible even if some of the time you end up getting a full stop out because you were hanging on um, and you didn't tighten your stop yet and so on paper yes it's more profitable to always trail but in reality it's difficult to stay in a trade where you have not moved your stop kind of hoping that it ends up being a big runner and you know, then you end up just saying, oh, I'm just going to get out here. I just hit the flatten button or, you know, whatever. Um, so in the real world, at least I have found I'm the most profitable when, you know, when I started splitting the position in half, which is, you know, over 10 years ago now doing it this way, um, I can get that first profit target, kind of have a breath. And it's like, okay, well, worst case scenario, it's a winning trade. And then that allows me to hang on to that second half of the position in that runner even longer, or at least all the way to, till it's profit target. Till it's, uh, that's a bad word for it. Till it breaks the candles low and it takes me out of the trade for a large profit, if you will. So just a, a handful of examples here. Um, looking for hammers. In an uptrend, this isn't, I guess, the greatest uh, the greatest chart because it doesn't show more of the left um, trend. But in an uptrend, you're going to be, you know, rallying, pull back, rally, pull back, and the general trend is up, even though you have these short term downtrends. And so when you're day trading, you know, I will start the day by looking at the prior day's high, low, close, but the overall daily trend really doesn't matter when we're day trading, because from the open to the close, we might end up going up on the day. But within the day, there's going to be all kinds of 
you know, maybe a 20 minute pullback, 30 minute strong uptrend, then another 15, 20 minute pullback. And so you can capitalize in both directions. And so you can go counter trend and be buying a hammer as the market has come down or uh, selling below an inverted hammer if the market has, has bounced, come up to a resistance level uh, and whatnot. But um, going with the trend uh, tends to give you a little bit more, uh, in, I don't want to say a little bit more momentum, um, but it's, it's a little bit of a safer, it, it kind of lowers your risk by starting out with going with the trend. And then uh, as you become more comfortable, you know, spotting the hammer and the inverted hammer is pretty easy to do because it's a very clear um, type of candle. And uh, even on a one minute chart, you know, you might only get eight, nine, 10 hammers, inverted hammers in the first hour of the day. So it's not like you have to filter through 50 different setups and uh, just looking for those hammers to get long and then kind of identifying, okay, yeah, the overall trend is up or we've come down to some kind of support level, 50% um, retracement, whatever you're using, uh, moving average, uh, prior days, high, low, close, something like that, value, market profile, value area. And uh, those kind of support levels can help indicate, okay, this is an area that I want to look for trades. Uh, another spot I really like that I've used for years is the 30-minute high and low. So after the first 30 minutes, nicely open, 9.30, so 10 o'clock Eastern time, mark the high of the day and the low of the day. If we stay within that 30-minute range, well, then by definition, we're range-bound, and it's going to be very tough trading. Unless the range is really big, then you can get some big moves between that range. But by and large, if we're stuck within the 30-minute range, I'm going to be extra cautious. If we get outside of that 30 minute range, especially, you know, 35 minutes, 40 minutes, 45 minutes into the day. So fairly quickly after the 30 minutes has passed. Okay. Now we have a better chance of being a trending day and, uh, you know, a pullback to the top of the 30 minute range to go long uh, and continue that uptrend would be, would be a nice place to look for a trade. Uh, double tops are really good places to look for inverted hammers. So this is an, actually this is an example of the 30 minute, uh, 30 minute high and low. So I've got those two lines marked on the chart. And a lot of the times you will trade from the top of the range to the bottom, as in this case. And so just selling one tick below the inverted hammer, the high of the tail of the hammer happens to line up with the, uh, the earlier high from the morning. So you have a double top. You're at the 30 minute high and you're just going to trail each candle all the way down until it breaks above the uh, breaks above a, a candle. And it, this one happened to break above a hammer to get me out of the trade, but uh, it doesn't have to be a hammer. It could be whatever candle breaks uh, the prior candles low. And so using some basic support and resistance that you're already familiar with, and just adding in the hammers and the inverted hammers is a really good way to uh, kind of spot trade entries. Um, halfway back or 50% retracement is another good place to look for trades. And uh, the market might, you know, you draw up a, a basic fib retracement um, or just take the first hour's range divided by two. That's also halfway back. And then just look for a hammer uh, to form. You can, this, this, Chart on the left here, that nicey tick I talked about the open, um, looking for the market to pull back and be in a low tick is helpful. So corresponding low tick with low price and corresponding high tick with high price would be the takeaway, kind of the most basic level of utilizing the nicey tick. You can kind of look at, I've got a trend line drawn on here. So uptrend on the nicey tick uptrend on the ES, looking for those th those two things to coincide can be helpful. But again, you don't need the nice tick to be able to trade the or day trade. And um, yeah, a, a hammer at a 50% retracement is a good, uh, good spot to look for long, flip it upside down, inverted hammer at a 50% retracement short is a good spot to, uh, to look for a trade to the downside. Um, so yeah, I just kind of mentioned this already, but uh, nicey tick looking for a low, 
nice see ticks to be down low in the trend as you're getting this tail of a hammer. And then if it's an inverted hammer, looking for high nice see ticks at, uh, at high price. Um, I also like when the tail of the hammer sticks down well below whatever the prior low was. So sometimes you come to the low of the day and you bounce off it perfectly and then you then you bounce. Other times you're kind of consolidating near the low of the day and then like in this case the tail we break lows and you go a couple of points below and then price is rejected and you come all the way back up to where that consolidation was or where that low break was and that shows a real strong price rejection and it makes for a really good place to get long um, kind of at that prior consolidation. And then, um, yeah, just trailing each bar or trailing swings, uh, like I said. So to kind of summarize everything here, kind of bring us bring us home, we've got the uh, the entry being the, just the basic hammers and inverted hammers. And, you know, a lot of times we can overcomplicate. I guess I've... I've spent my trading career simplifying things and just everything I've done in life, um, trying to bring it to its simplest form so that I can have clarity. And you know, I'm a pretty neat person and uh, I like to keep a clean desk and that helps me keep a clean mind. And if I'm training for something or you know, just kind of following the 80-20 principle, doing 20% of what's required the most important 20% is going to give you 80% of the results. And so with trading, you don't want to overcomplicate. You don't want 50 screens and uh, charts and 10 monitors and whatnot. Keeping things very simple, just looking for hammers to go long as the basic concept, um, inverted hammers to go short, and then kind of breaking it down. Okay, well, where do I want to find these hammers? In pullbacks, at halfway back uh, longs, at double bottoms, at uh, the 21 EMA or uptrend lines, and then the pairing that with a low nicey tick, and then taking that whole chunk and then flipping it upside down, inverted hammer to go short, looking for halfway back shorts and uh, double tops, 21 EMA, you know, to go uh, in a downtrend, and then uh, a high nicey tick to be going short. Starting out with your stop at the Outside of the entry candle, um, you can set your bracket order up to be a three-point stop and then six-point target. Uh, in trade of eight, you can have, uh, same with think or swim, you can have open-ended targets. So half of the position is a six-point target, and then the other half of the position is just no target. Um, that works really well. Um, I really like uh, trade of eight's bracket orders and, and just trade management and stuff. Um, and they have a smaller intraday margins. I know Thinkorswim, I, I tr also trade on Thinkorswim, but uh, for most people, um, you know, their intraday margins are full, you know, almost $20,000. So uh, you don't necessarily, if you have $100,000 sitting in your account um, and it's not doing anything, you know, there's better uses for your capital as a, uh, as a day trader than just having a whole bunch of cash sitting there and not earning anything. So uh, something like trade of eight where you have $500 intraday margins is going to be more practical. Um, so starting with your stop outside the entry candle and then trailing your stop, either trailing each bar or trailing swings. Um, trailing each bar is a good introductory way to uh, trade management. And it, you know, it gives you something to do. You have a very clear approach to how you're going to manage the trade and you know exactly what you're going to do and you can tighten your stop uh, fairly quickly. And so, yeah, there's going to be handfuls of trades that only go for a couple of points and you get taken out. But the nice thing is you're trading the same way, whether it ends up being a home run or just a couple of points. And so it's, you might think, Oh, why don't I just set a target for, you know, one and a half points with a three point stop and I could get a high winning percentage. Well, all it takes is a couple of stop outs and you wipe out, you know, an entire week of trades. So you really need of, of profits. So you need those home runs or those bigger winners to help offset the small losses. And also going into a trade, you then know, okay, I could have a couple of losers, 
and one winning trade can make up for a couple of those losers. So getting into like a 60, 65 percent win rate is really all you need when you're averaging, you know, around two to one reward to risk. And then uh, if you're going to trail the swing highs and lows, watching for three consecutive bars. So if you're short three or I'm sorry, four consecutive bars. So four red bars in a row if you're short and then you can switch to trailing each candle. Um, if you're long looking for four green bars, you know, each candle makes a new high and then you can, uh, that's a good way to get into, um, to tighten your stop. If you're starting conservative and then get tighter as the trade uh, starts going your way. So that's what I got for you. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Um, I, next month I am doing a masterclass. Um, I do it once a year. Uh, it'll be December 2nd and uh, I'll go through kind of my strategies and, and the uh, traders that um, are in the class to kind of use it as a launching point for, uh, for the, the new year. So I'll talk about the one minute chart uh, trades, the, um, two other strategies that I use as well, the 15 minute opening range breakout and uh, retracements on the 512 tick chart. So um, you can go over to Emini Mind if you want to check that out. Otherwise, uh, got my email there if you do have specific questions and um, David will be sending out a recording as well so you can review that later on. So thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to, uh, to speak at these and uh, wish you good trading and have a great rest of your day.